John, it's great to meet you. It's fantastic. This is a wonderful opportunity for you. I have something for you that you are going to be just oh, absolutely okay. amazed at. It is going to only cost you $5, and that $5 is going to buy you the very best thing in your whole life. Was it something I said? The reason, I have two reasons, really, for doing that little skit. One is that my presentation is primarily about a kind of a continuum from that as one end of the continuum and the other being to sell yourself or sell a product by telling a story. And the other reason is that you only get one chance to make a good first impression, and I just messed that up. So I'm going to try to convince you that I'm not that guy. I'm going to do that by telling you some stories about myself. And the first one, you need to understand just where my head was when I did this. And it was a stressful situation. It was something that I didn't have much choice about, but I made the best of it. I'm a local guy, grew up here, went to high school here, went to college here, met my wife here, raised a family here. My daughter went here to college. Uh, she joined this little musical group some of you may be familiar with. And uh, that's a picture of us outside the Alamo Bowl a few years ago. Now, things were going along pretty well, and I found out I was going to lose my job. So, I'm 60 years old. I'm a salesperson. I've been selling for a lot of small companies in central Pennsylvania, individuals and small companies, doing all kinds of things. But I was going to lose my job at 60. Now, at 60, nobody's really too interested in hiring you for a sales position. They're looking for somebody who's younger, more active, more vigorous, and that they can take advantage of. And I came down to one interview. Now, it was a good company. Uh, they needed somebody just like me in the geographic location I happened to be living in. It was a good, good combination. But I had one interview. Financially speaking, it was do or die. I'm raising two daughters, one in college, one in high school about to go into college. And by the way, my wife is in the process of dying of cancer. She had one that you just do not get better from. So financially speaking, it was do or die. I went into this interview and I did something that I'm not going to encourage anyone else to do. It was bold to the point of being real close to the line of being rude. I took over the interview. The gentleman that I was interviewing with was the sales manager and vice president of a $40 million a year company. He needed a guy just like me. I took some calculated risks and I said to him, listen, I think I can save us both a lot of time if you'll let me tell a story. He was very reluctant. You could tell that I had kind of upset his apple cart. But he was quiet and polite. And I told him this story, which happens to be a true story. My wife and I wanted a new furnace. Ours is 25 years old. We wanted to add an air conditioning system. So I made three phone calls. The first gentleman came in the house, walked to the back of the furnace, looked at the number on the back of it, and said, well, Mr. Rischel, you have 125,000 BTU furnace, our new furnace, along with a new air conditioning system installed, ready to go, is $2,500. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Second gentleman comes in, does the same thing the first guy does, but his reaction was quite a bit different. Oh my goodness gracious, only 125,000 BTU furnace. I don't know why they do this. You're struggling along here with this little thing. This is just way too small. You've got to have at least 150,000 BTU furnace. And ours new installed with the new air conditioning system is $3,500. Now, understand, I gave you about 30 seconds of what this guy did to me for 30 minutes. He tried everything in the book to get me to sign here, sign now, buy, 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 buy. As it went along, it became obvious I wasn't going to buy, and he pulled out the big guns. He looked my wife square in the eye, and he said, if this furnace kicks on just one more time, you're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, goodbye. Third guy shows up. Third guy is driving a pickup truck. Not a fancy pickup truck, but a nice pickup truck. Fairly modern, clean, neat, no dents, no dirt. The second guy, by the way, was driving a Cadillac. The third guy is dressed in clothes 
that you'd wear to take a new furnace to a house, take the old one out, put it in a truck, put the new one in. The second guy was dressed like he was going to a cocktail party. Lots of big rings, big necklace. I won't say he looked sleazy, but he was on the highway to there at a high rate out of control. All right. The third guy does not go to the back of the furnace and look at the tag. The third guy sits down and asks me two questions. How big's the house? How much insulation's in it? And he scribbled and scratched a little bit and punched some numbers into his calculator, looked up at me and said, well, Mr. Rischel, you need a 63,000 BTU unit. The closest I can come to that is a 65,000. Will that be all right? I did not ask him how much it was going to cost. I asked him how soon he could install it. Now, at this point, I turned to the sales manager. I looked him in the eye and I said, you don't want the first guy. Nobody does. The second guy is the fella the people I'm working for now want me to be. I'm the third guy, and if that's what you're looking for, we have something to talk about. Okay, I'm not breathing at this point. It's all on the line. It's do or die, right? And when he said what I'm about to tell you, he said, I'm pretty sure my heart stopped beating. Well, the interview's over. Okay. <laughs> You'll have to talk to the president of the company, but he almost always hires the people I want. So I got the job. Now, that's kind of a complicated roundabout way of explaining what I want to try and get across to you all. I didn't invent this system. It's been around forever. Abraham Lincoln was famous for telling these little stories to get his point across. And that's generally what I did in this situation and in others. I'm going to give you a very, very simplistic version of all that to try and catch everybody that I might have left behind. Daddy, 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 candy, 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 daddy, candy, daddy, candy, daddy. Who hasn't heard this? If we could remember back far enough, I'm sure you could remember doing it yourselves. But anyway, it's a rude, crude, and socially unacceptable way of getting what you want. It's, it's, it's bludgeoning someone into cooperating. And there's a better way of doing it. But in order to do that, you need to understand what it is you want, what it is the other person wants, needs, desires, or how they're thinking, you know, where they're coming from, what their frame of reference is. So you change candy, 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 daddy, daddy, daddy to this little scenario. And I'm making this up, but, it, but I think it'll prove the point. You know, Father, yesterday while I was helping my little sister put away her toys, I thought about what you said about setting a good example for her, and I'm really going to try to do that. Pause. It's very important to pause at the right point. You want to separate that part from this next part just a little bit. Oh, by the way, Dad, did you know that today Mother went to the store and got your favorite candy? Stop. Okay? You got to stop it at the right place. Don't say anything more. You've done all you can do. But what parent isn't going to say, well, son, you go get me a piece of that candy and you be sure and get one for yourself. It's going to work almost every time. Now, some of you aren't going to buy into that. You're going to think that's a little far-fetched. Maybe that would work, but yeah, I don't know. But try this real-life story on for size. Free beer. I uh, drank a little beer when I was in college. There was a certain bar downtown across the street from campus that I frequented fairly often. I mean, the waitstaff knew me, the managers knew me, that kind of thing. And I was sitting there one night, and this story just popped into my head. I mean, I didn't really have any plan for it. It, it just sort of, you know, it, it's just something I happened to remember. That 10 or 12 years before, my father and a friend of his had removed the furnace from that building for the owner who was getting ready to open this bar. And we're doing this guy a favor, okay? We're taking this big ugly, heavy, dirty thing out of his building that he's trying to make all nice and pretty so he can invite people in for beer and, and food. And as we were leaving, he said to my father and his buddy, you guys be sure and stop back. I'll give you a free beer. I stopped. I didn't say anything more. Didn't expect anything. Here's one on the house. All right. This is great. Free beer. This is really good. Okay. So, a couple of nights later, different bartender made sure the other one wasn't in sight. 
I did it again. Now, here's another part of this whole scenario that's really important. You've got to have a little morality. You've got to consider the power you're wielding here. Because there's a clear delineation between doing something that is good for everybody and taking advantage of a situation. So, and I didn't realize it at the time, but somewhere between the second and the 22nd time that I used that story, it became not having a good time, but stealing beer from the guy. All right? So, at about the same time this was happening, I noticed this picture in the Daily Collegian, the local campus newspaper. The headline read, Women Liberate Campus Patrol. The blonde lady sitting is Marjorie Plosky. The other lady is named Arlene Rochelle. And in 1972, they were audacious and bold enough to apply for positions with the all-male 60 to 70 men strong student campus patrol division. And they were hired. They were, as best I know, the first ladies anywhere for probably 50 or 60 miles around to here wearing anything even close to a police uniform at the time. This was big news. Please believe me, they were, they were celebrities. They had done something no women had ever done before. Many have done it since. You'll see a lot of young ladies around campus here wearing a uniform, directing traffic, writing tickets, whatever it is they do now, guiding you at, at various events. But these were the first two. Later, I joined the campus patrol. I remember seeing Marjorie for the first time across the room, and she was very tall, blonde, very beautiful. And I remember thinking to myself, well, she'll never have anything to do with me. Well, just to prove to you that I'm not always right, after a bumpy on again, off again, 12 year relationship, we were married and raised a family together. <laughs> okay, so. Flash forward to 62 years of age. I decided to get hearing aids. She'd only been bugging me for 25 years. Um, and the audiologist and I got along really well together. We clicked, as it, you'd say, and I offered my services to her to help her sell her products and services. I'm a salesman. You know, given another sales presentation, no big deal. And they did an article for me on, in their... Uh, quarterly newsletter. This is the Mountain Disney Physicians Group here locally. And they came up with this poster after they sent me to a professional photographer for a photo shoot. Now, this is a photo shoot just like the ones you see on TV where the high priced model has got four or five people scurrying around them and running behind the camera while the cameraman snaps away. They believe me, and, and, and you're not going to want to, but it's true. They took between seven and eight hundred pictures of me that afternoon. They only used four. One of them was for this poster. The poster was used bigger than life at the entrance to the hospital. All the entrances had one, all the waiting rooms had one. The local newspapers uh, ran this as an ad. And I was like page three or four in town and gown and the whole back cover of State College the Magazine. It was kind of a big deal. Now, I didn't do all these ads. I only did this one, but they did a total of 12 ads you know, cardiology, pediatrics, obstetrics, the whole, the whole range of services that the physician's group uh, offered. So they did 12 ads. Now, you folks, most of you, are gonna have trouble getting your brain around what I'm gonna spring on you next because it, it's kinda unusual, all right? And, and there's a reason for me showing it to you. They did 12 ads, there's 12 months in a year. They came out with a calendar. I was Mr. May, the centerfold. <laughs> All right, now, why am I bringing that up? Well, if you're poor, you could end up being rich. If you're sick, you could end up getting well. If you're sad, you could end up having a great, happy life. Because if this face can end up on a centerfold of a calendar, anything's possible. All right? <laughs> so, life progresses on. And... Life offers you opportunities, and my point to this whole presentation is that you need to take a look at not just what you want, but what the people you're trying to influence, the people you need to work with, want, and try and incorporate 
your message to them on how you can cooperate with them, how you can motivate them into what you're seeing and, and tell them a story. Try to be a little bit indirect about it. You know, come up with something that, you know, is going to work for you. And what I want you to do is think about whether you're a salesperson or not. All of us are, all right? There's no escaping it. Could I have another napkin, please? That's a sales presentation, okay? It can be something very simple. And my point to you is that when you do get into that clutch moment, when you absolutely have to make the deal, you need to practice on the little things. Practice on the little motivations that you can make to someone. Don't, don't wait till that last minute. Prepare for that interview. Get ready for it. Think about what that person's going to want, need, or desire. That gentleman hiring that salesperson at the beginning of the presentation, I knew he wanted either salesman number three or salesman number two. I took a 50-50 shot at it, and I gave him what I wanted to do. I didn't want salesman number two's job. Bad jobs are easy to get. If, if you don't put any effort through it, if you can't see what you're going to get out of it, if, if it's just falling in your lap, chances are it's not going to work out very well. So that's my message. And going back to my life a little bit, it's kind of ironic that on the year, in the month, that I'm on a calendar, the 7th of May, a Thursday, was the day my wife drew her last breath. And as a tribute to her and to everyone who suffered with cancer and to everyone who's taken care of someone who's suffered with cancer, I'd like to recite just a couple lines from uh, one of John Denver's lesser known songs. But I miss her in the morning when I wake alone. The absence of her laughter is a cold and empty sound. Her memory always makes me smile and I want you to know that I love her. I truly do love her but now I must let her go. Thank you all very much and have a great life.